Good morning and happy coffee day. Every day is coffee day. This video really is in relation to two of my viewers, sources of information and learning on both sides. I'm learning um, from both of you. Part one, Matthew, Mattatulin Matt, rainbow trout hunter, giraffe hunter. I asked him if I had permission to uh, use a photo he sent. He's holding his bow and he's in proximity to an unusual creature. Hopefully he will say yes. But his question, the bulk of it had to do with Penobscot bows and double bows, which first off, I have to say that all Penobscot, well, all what we term Penobscot bows, I'm sure they had bows that weren't double bows, but let's just say for the fun of uh, argument here that all Penobscot bows are double bows, but not all double bows are Penobscot bows. Matt was wondering whether or not Penobscot bows are double bows which can be two different things now. Now we know. Were used in areas where they didn't have good bow woods. Well, Penobscot bows, pen, or Penobscot, Maine, they had good bow wood. They did. Because their bows, their Penobscot bows were hickory, which is a good bow wood. Other people from time to time, including those who read Tom Brown Jr. books, have an understanding that double bows are good for green wood. You can make a green wood, you know, it's it not cured, not dry, just make your bow, your double bow, and, and off you go. Because there's an interesting little thing that happens that those double bows act like cable bows. You're raising the neutral plane, possibly to above the surface of the main bow, to where the main bow is just basically operating in compression not taking any set really, maybe it's getting shorter, like us old guys, and the back bow is under tension, and maybe it does get deformed. I don't, I personally don't see how a greenwood bow will stretch any more than, you know, a dried piece of wood. But you've created this greenwood bow that's not really going to see detrimental effects because it's green, because bow one, compression, bow two, tension, like a cable bow. And so they do operate like cable bows. So why indeed did the pent-up Scots make double bows, even though they had hickory? I don't know. I honestly don't know. Some have theorized, well, it's a good way to have a single bow unit that has a variable draw weight, which I can agree with. You know, you could unhook the back bow and have a light bow, you could really torque the cable down that connects the two bows um, and have a heavy bow. And so you've got two bows in one. Maybe, maybe not, I don't know. There are some that say the museum specimens of Penobscot bows, they were not old. They were invented in about 1900. Maybe for, who knows, the world trade or the world um, trade fair whatever the thing was maybe it was a demonstration bow who knows maybe they use those historically depends on who you ask what is the benefit the true benefit of having a double bow as a penobscot bow now we're going penobscot well if you look at them they're made out of hickory so they don't need to be double bows but an unusual feature of them is Unlike so many native bows made out of white woods, the belly of their main bow is rounded. I mean, it's just round like a dowel and it's flattened off at the top. So then it mates with the back bow, which is flat on the bottom and rounded on the top, which is kind of counterintuitive to what's good. But the units apparently work because of the double bow action. Although they were more complex, were they easier to make because you had a rounded belly? I don't know. I have no good answer to why Penobscot bows exist. Some will say, well, you can change the force draw curve. Let's not get too out there. That just means in a standard bow, the farther you pull it back, the heavier the draw weight. And it's not linear. 
usually it's now I pull it back an inch it's going to increase one pound I pull it back another inch it's going to increase 1.3 pounds pull it back another inch it's going to increase two two pounds I'm going to pull it back another inch it's going to increase three and a half pounds it's, it's a curve force draw curve and some may say that the force draw curve of a double bow I'm not saying Penobscot bow now I'm using double bow if you're using creative geometries varying the length of the back bow compared to the main bow blah 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 in the connection points you could conceivably get a compound bow action where it, it lets off now I personally have experimented a lot with double bows a lot with double bows varying the the geometry the relative lengths of the bows and the connection points and recurving the back bows blah 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 connect where they connect onto the main bow going almost like to a home guard or a molar gay bed you know where the connection point is deep in and then I've got the molar gay bed tips on it and the best I could do was have the force draw curve kind of taper off where you kept pulling back and it didn't increase the draw weight but you're getting a greater draw length which gives it a more push so there is a benefit there but I don't know long answer the only thing I can say for sure with double bows is it's a good way to make a greenwood bow you make a double bow out of greenwood you use it for a while, the main bow dries off, and you shed the back bow. You'll see that in one of Tom Brown Jr.'s books. He's Tom Brown Jr.'s, How to Make a Survival Bow. It's a back bow because it's made out of green wood, which you can say is what a survival bow should be. It's a quick bow that could be made on a spot and used immediately. Double bow. Okay, now on to the next subject. I have a viewer, Errol. Tremendous artist. If I had money, I wouldn't necessarily buy paintings with it, but I would buy one of Errol's paintings. They're beautiful. He's an awesome portrait artist. He does great scenes of horses and, and teepees and the life of the Northern Plains because that's him, a Cinnaboyan. Uh, he sent me some pictures, and I apologize. You know, if I'm calling you out, I... I I really don't know you well enough to know if you want to be, you know, promoted amongst my five viewers. <laughs> A little more than that, but not into the millions. So I'm hoping it's okay. But he sent me a picture, a grouping of pictures taken at a museum in I, Helena, Montana, of a bow. And what's truly special about this bow, connection to Arrow, has his last name on it because this was his great uncle's horse bow and um, he said that his great uncle was taught how to make bows by and you know you can jump generations I've personally known people that were born in the late 1800s they're not around anymore but I knew them in my younger days when I was alive I remember seeing pictures of recent photographs of Civil War veterans you know we connect definitely to the past and his great uncle was taught how to make bows by most likely people that made the bows and hunted buffalo on horseback you know and went on raids and stuff like that and so wow that's incredible that would be like uh, me locating this this conquistadore helmet that somebody said once I don't remember who that was in our family we don't have Spanish in our background we have the native side and so it would be like wow maybe one of one of my progenitors knocked off a Spaniard marching through the swamps and jungles trying to steal gold you know and they took his helmet and it's still in the family who knows you, you hear a lot of things um, but yeah the bow that Errol sent me the pictures of you know I was aware of these things I was aware of the lengths and the shapes and the sizes of the staves because you could see the pith in, in this bow it was made from a very small stave but it finally clicked I'm slow but I'll get there you know where's 
there was great variety in the bows within bands and within tribes, probably more than the differences between tribes, you know, because they're individual bow makers. And some of them probably did have, you know, the angles that we put in our bows in the grooves, but this one had made with a knife. And so they were just grooves, one in the top end and two in the bottom end. You know, and you have to think about how they're strong. Not like this probably, but like this. So that would determine what side that single groove at the top would be. And also the weight. You're on the back of a horse. Are you going to want to string, you know, an English war bow weighted bow? Or maybe a 45 pounder? You know, you think about it. If you've hunted before, you realize that with a razor sharp broadhead, You can you can penetrate pretty good, and if you have a, several people aiming at the same animal, especially at a sh short distance, you know, not 90 yards, but you're on this horse here, and there's a bison right there. You don't need to have like a mega a mega wattage bow. So there are a lot of things to think about. That bow has taught me a lot. Slapped me on my head, dropped a brick on my face. Listen to me. This is what these bows are. Well, anyway, I rambled on long enough. Rambled on. I'm not going to sing to you again. Led Zeppelin. Go lead. It's one of those things, again, slapped me in my face. You know, when I was in high school, I didn't listen to a lot of Led Zeppelin. It was like Ozark Mountain Daredevils and Bill Monroe and Stanley Brothers. Maybell Carter. The seldom scene with John Duffy and Charlie McCoy. But in my later years, I've really appreciated the complexity and the artistry and just the musicality of Led Zeppelin. How amazing they were. And not really cocky guys. Oh, I, I'm going to stop now. Have a good one. Thank you for watching.